You're listening to Views from the Jump Seat Podcast. Bunker up. Buckle in. It's time for the show to begin. One thing remains constant in the fire service is that we start day one in the jump seat. So if you're a chief officer, welcome back. If you're the day one probationary, welcome aboard. It's time for Jump Seat Radio. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Jump Seat Radio, the podcast that grabs the microphone, hits the record switch, and don't tell my guests that we're recording. What's up, Jeff? What's going on, man? <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to the Jump Seat Nation. I'm going to let you handle your bio because I will screw it all up. But we've got a, a young man on here. He's got the California sunshine in the background. I'm very jealous of you right now. But, Jeff, tell me who you are, where you come from, and why the heck you're here. Yeah, man. Uh, so, Jeff Bandman. I've uh, been around a little bit. Uh, grew up in the D.C. area. Grew up in the firehouse. Started uh, riding uh, at 16. Uh Got hired right out of high school, spent a couple of years as a career guy, got all aboard, uh, met a uh, recruiter uh, from the Army who happened to be from Ranger Battalion and we thought that sounded like a fun idea at the time. Uh, so joined the Army, uh, spent uh, first chunk with 3rd Ranger Battalion, the second half with uh, a reconnaissance unit out of Fort Bragg. Uh, uh, did Kosovo in 99, got out, got back to the firehouse, got back to crisis management stuff, and then shortly post 9-11, uh, got recruited by the agency and spent about a decade with CIA doing stuff around the world. And then uh, in the last few years, did a lot of training and development with them. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of my work and stuff comes from now, uh, running uh, running the show, running outmindset.com, how we got connected through uh, some of the guys at Brute Force. Right. And yeah, just really looking at uh, behavioral patterns, why we do what we do when we do it. I think that's what drew me in when, when and to, to give some people, uh, give the people a back history of how you and I met. It was through Brute Force Sandbags. Thank you, Justin, and the Brute Force people for hooking us up. I love meeting awesome, cool people like you. And you did say you kind of you kind of brushed over this, but you did say three little letters. It starts in C and ends in A. And, and that that right there is just something that absolutely blows my mind. How you ever got into that? Uh, how you stayed in that and how you, you, I guess to me from the outside view of that, you'd have to have a life pretty much shrouded in secrecy. Would I be correct when I say that? Um, you know, to some extent, it's definitely not, uh, it's not like the movies. Uh, right, 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 right. And, and, you know, and I've got a little different attitude towards some of it. You know, I've got buddies that are just all like, uh, don't say anything, don't talk about anything kind of guys. Right. Uh, and I always laugh at them. No, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think for the time that uh, uh, that I was working overseas, you know, it is very much a, a time and space where, you know, you just watch the boundaries of how you communicate. I mean, right. guys, I, mean, I would even, you know, I always traveled in and out of D.C. when I would go on trips, so I'd hang at the firehouse. Uh, matter of fact, the guys dropped me off at Dulles one day, <laughs> pulled, pulled up in the fire truck and, you know, get out, Pelican cases, everything else. Everybody's looking like, why is this guy getting out of the fire truck to get on an airplane? <laughs> Um, don't tell anybody. I'm sure they'll get in trouble. for Right, that. right, but, right, right. Uh, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I mean, even the guys at the firehouse didn't know. I mean, I can remember one time a uh, guy called me and said, hey, man, you're on the front page of the Washington Post. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I'm not. He's like, yeah, you are. I'm like, no, no, really, I'm not. And uh, and so it turned out to be, you know, one of the contract companies or something. There's somebody that looked, looked like me. But, uh, but yeah, so nobody really knew at the time. Uh, and, you know, you just kept your mouth shut, kept quiet and you did your job. And that's that's what what drew me to you, Jeff, is um, I want to start off the interview today. And and, and and I'm sorry for throwing you on the bus. You start, you asked me when we started this. I was like, what are we going to talk about today? I have no freaking clue. But I tell you where we are going to start. And this is something yeah. that drew me to you. And especially with your background is you run a website called the Op Mindset. Number one, what the heck is an Op Mindset? Yeah, man, absolutely. I think, you know, years ago, it, this kind of started, I sat in a guy's class at the agency, who taught a combat mindset course. And for years in some of the weapons programs, you know, there was this operate, there was this combat mindset course that was taught. Uh, and I watched, I, I watched this guy teach great content, but totally missing with the audience, right? The guys in the room are just kind of like, okay, right. what's this? 
uh, and so not connecting at all. Uh, and I've always been a huge study of human behavior and really trying to dissect what we did. It kind of drove everybody around me crazy. Uh, always re-engineering training exercises. I mean, I think we talked about that. I ran my first full-scale exercise in the firehouse at 17. Uh, you know, I always have a, a different view of how things could happen. Right. And uh, and I sat in this class and was just like, man, this this sucks. <laughs> And, you know, looking at it, I was like, well, and even in the title, now these people are going to combat. I mean, they may be going to high risk environments. They may be working in combat zones, right. but they're not going to combat. And, you know, I, I've never been a big believer that mindset is related to the narrative in our head. And so I geeked out. I started deep diving in, uh, started really doing a crap ton of research in human physiology in cognitive science, in uh, psychology, uh, everything that was coming out at the time. I uh, started looking at biofeedback metrics, started really trying to understand what causes a certain set of behaviors in a certain set of conditions. And that's really what it comes from. And so over time, what we did was we started to shift it from a combat mindset to an operational mindset. And op mindset really is that, right? Because we all operate in various ways, whether it's a firehouse, or whether it's as a law enforcement officer or state department or agency or military, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, we step out in the world, we, we choose a life of hazard and risk. And so in order to really be successful there and be successful coming home, you know, what I really discovered was understanding how to develop this operational mindset, which entails so much more than just, you know, boosting myself up, right? The right. voice of the head and the narrative going on. Cause really that's just bullshit. <laughs> it's so funny that you bring up the narrative in your head, because I think a lot of us play that out of what it should be like, but oh, then, dude. but then we arrive and it's not like that. And nope. I, and I think that's what, when, when we did our first webcasts and, and hopefully we'll be able to see that stuff as you, as you gradually roll this op mindset stuff out, how does mm -hmm. that, how does that influence decision-making? I think it's huge, man. I mean, I think when you begin to understand what happens to you physiologically and, 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 and mentally, right? So what happens to the body, what happens to the brain, how it all interacts and works under stress, uh, under various conditions. I'm sorry, the boys are going behind me. I <laughs> That's <tired>. right. <laughs> uh, firehouse is right down the street. Nice. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I, the more you begin to understand what's occurring at any given moment in time, the more power you have to manage it, right. And then mitigate the impacts. And so if our physiological response rises, we feel that heartbeat response, there's other things that are going on that begins to diminish our cognitive ability. You know, I kind of talk about the cognitive aperture and keeping it as open as possible. Now we begin to miss details. We begin to, what I like to call future cast, um, you know, think about what's going to happen, uh, think about what might be happening. Like you said, we start to get into the shoulds, uh, coulds, whens, ifs. Uh, we start to really think forward and we stop being really available to what's occurring. And so when you look at decision making, you know, we've done a bunch of after action reports and after action analysis on, you know, a variety of incidents. And probably the number one thing that you find is, now, people aren't making decisions based off current conditions. They're based off of projected conditions, things the things they think they are seeing, the biases that are created, or uh, some future point that they want to create. They're not making effective decisions that are going that are that are impacting this you know the moment right now. But at some point, some of this we have to be doing though, right? I mean, we we don't want to 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 absolutely tell them. That, that you can't future cast or you can't. Oh, no, there's, there's, yeah, ways to do it, man. Visualization, right. rehearsals, all that stuff. So critical, even, and I call it the arm sweep. So I call it the, the three foot rule, which is my, my, my present situation and three feet in front of me. All right. Uh, all right. right? Uh, so, you know, I used to, and I, you know, I've been, the three foot rule and the 10 degree rule are probably the two most important things that I like to teach and talk about. You know, that three foot rule is really what's happening in the next three feet. And so I plan for it accordingly and act accordingly. Uh, and then, and let the, you know, you let the chief worry about a few other things, right? right. You let the captain worry about it. You know, you, you stage it out uh, uh, and you focus in your zone. And then the 10 degree rule, right, is the ability to 
adjust based on the conditions. You know, I used to say, listen, you pull up, I got a two story single family home, heavy fire from the second floor, make an entry with my crew of three, start the primary search, locate see fire, fire, right? Right. Uh, and then you kick the door, you step inside and the conditions are changed, have changed. This is not the script. This is where yeah. we're in. This is not what yeah, I was dude. expecting. Yeah, dude. So, I mean, I think that, and I think this is relevant, right? The 10 degree rule is you've already made a decision. You know, your job, you know, what has to be accomplished, right? Now you're going to move 10 degrees left or right based on the changes in the conditions as they are occurring. You know, are you getting heat alleviation? Are you getting smoke alleviation? Is something actually occurring uh, that causes a change of course? I don't have to redo a whole decision cycle. Right. Right. We don't have to come into a huddle and be like, what do we need to do now? <laughs> you know what you need to do now. Get off your ass and move. Right. And and flow in the environment. And you and I talked about this on our on our last session that you you your stuff just absolutely blew me away. How do you replicate that? And I won't say in a complete safe way. And I know that's where brute force and you guys are going to hook up. But it's like you had a really neat um, approach to teaching firefighters, operators, police officers, uh, even corporate America, which I was, was was super cool on how to make that op mindset into I, I don't know if I'm gonna say permanent, but give them that ten degree vision, I guess. Yeah, man. I think, I think, you know, most people, when we train, we train very much task oriented, right? Right. You know, you, you're doing your drills, the station, or you're taking a course or whatever else. So it's very task based training, uh, you know, do X and achieve Y. Right. Period, right. And one of the things that, that really inhibits performance is the various applications of stress and the conditions that arise almost prior to the event. And so some of the things you and I talked about, right? We walked through kind of the, the human performance learning protocol model that begins to show you how to create conditions before, you know, before the, the quote unquote training event even occurs. You know, you step into one of my courses, you don't have a pencil for a reason, right? The temperature in the room is set for a reason. It's right. too hot or it's too cold. Um, you know, you're the guy without a chair. Sorry. Um, <laughs> right? uh, but all those little minor details right. impact everything moving forward. And so when you start to create training environments and really want to accelerate the capability of your people, because what you want is you want a behavioral change. Right. You don't want a tactical change. Right. Right. Uh, you know, there are times to run lines and, you know, throw ladders and do the basics 100% then create context around the ladder throw around the, you know, pulling that line. What are the issues that are at hand? Um, and so how can you just, and, and it can be super easy. It's not like it's massively complex. You know, I used to at the agency and other places, you know, I would always pull guys back. They'd want to, you know, more bombs, more bullets, more bangs, more this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, dude, we don't need to do all that. You right. Know, let, let me get on the radio. And I will left these guys up more than any explosion could ever have, uh, you know, just because it's it starts to cause cognitive distance in particular moments, start to just starts to draw the patterns of thinking away from the task at hand. Right. And I think when you can do that and recreate that in your training environments, you are beginning to see what I like to call actions and character. Right. Which is which is what these, what the, what the guys will do, what people will do in a particular moment in time under a set of conditions. And, and you chose a really interesting video to put up on your website. And I think it's Fairfax County or Fairfax city. Uh, oh, where, the, the Loudoun County one. Loudoun County. There you go. Yeah. yeah when, those are guys. I, my buddy was a second in engine officer that day. Really? Uh, yeah. So that, yeah. that one really kind of, kind of brings it home to that, that mindset, because I really think that they got the tunnel vision they got the task fixations. They got the mission myopia, whatever Dr. G calls it, whatever that you all brain yeah. smart nerds calls. But they lost sight of what their goals were and stuff went slideways. How Quite does right. a young firefighter who doesn't have that experience of being on a ghetto engine in Detroit and goes to fire every other day, how do they stop, start building that op mindset? Yeah, I mean, I think you, one, you have to learn from every single thing available. Uh, and... You know, I did a podcast a month ago or so, uh, and a guy asked me, he's like, what's the one thing that separates, right? The, the, right. Kind of the top performers from everybody else. What's, what's the difference? And my answer was the willingness to pause Ooh. in sheer chaos, right? 
And it's a, it is a disciplined approach that over a career, you know, over five, we have 10, 15 years, 20 years becomes natural. Right. In a lot of cases, not every case, but in a lot of cases. And, you know, when I talk to the young guys today, when I'm, when I'm working to train and develop guys today, you know, it is instilling that willingness to pause. And we're only talking about seconds in time. Right. You know, and so that's the preventative maintenance to to overrunning your headlights, right? To not seeing what's there. That goes back to what we talked about in decision making. Am I present in the moment? And I'm working on the the full, you know, my write up. And I do my, you know, it's my opinion and my analysis of it based right. on all my experience, et cetera. Um, and I know the guys that were involved in the incident. And, you know, they're good guys. They're good firemen. The lieutenant's a good guy. Very smart, very sharp. But when you begin to look at the things that cloud judgment at a particular moment in time, it becomes a breakdown and that that failure to pause in a particular moment to be present with the conditions. And so, uh, you know, you look at that that particular incident, you look back at radio traffic, you look at the information coming in, you start to create biases. This has happened to all of us, you know, no, oh, yeah free of this no. uh, whatsoever. You know, I don't sit here in judgment because I'm such a badass. Right. Right. <laughs> right? Uh, we've all fall. We have all fall victim to, to believing the information coming in. Right. Okay. It looks like it's in the attic. You know, this is all this radio traffic going back and forth. And I start to create a perception before I'm even there. And then I don't pause to actually see the conditions. And at each moment at each kind of phase line that I cross, right. Each threshold, I've got my outside, I've done my walk around, I'm making entry into the house, right? These are all being available to the conditions begin to, to show you what's actually taking place. And in that particular video, you know, the first time I saw it, I was, I was working for the agency. I'd come back to fire house and <coughs> excuse me, one of the guys says, you got to see this and watching that video, of course, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking it, sure. but just watching it, when you see those smoke conditions change prior to the, prior to the building flashing, you can see that smoke start to shift. I got sick to my stomach. I was like, dude, this is, you know, I knew it was going badly. Right. Not even really knowing what happened, you can tell. And so, uh, you know, I freaking Jim Kaiser used to teach a class called The Art of Reading Smoke. I'm sure it's probably around. Yep, yep. Now, whatever yep, else, yep. right? But what an amazing class, right? What a, a, creating that fundamental knowledge and then being available to the conditions. That's, that's it, man. That is the operational mindset. That is the capacity to really navigate, negotiate every moment. So what do you think happens to those humans? Because I, I know Loudoun County, I know Fairfax County, those guys, yeah. they go to fires. I mean, we're, we're not talking about rural, middle of America. I mean, these guys go work. I mean, you can yeah. tell that they're organized. You can tell. Totally. And, and I'll, I'll tell you who I think the superstar of, of that of that video was. I've, I've watched it a million times. What happens to us that those guys and girls – lose focus of it because if you would take them out of that situation and sat them down here at this desk they're like well those guys are idiots how come they can't see that coming they didn't see it coming that day yeah they didn't they didn't and it could have been any one of us oh right? <laughs> hello <Dude. laughs> it yeah, happens to me all the time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right yeah but what yeah. what happens to our, our 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 physiological response to make that happen so when you begin to look at things internally right you know it's it's a it is what I call the stacking effect. And so, and I can map that with data, right? <laughs> From our yeah, last man. one, I got that on there. Yeah, yeah. And dude, I mean, I've got, I've got piles and piles and piles of actual data that show this. Right. So here's generally what happens. We're hanging out at the firehouse, you know, smoking, joking, doing whatever we're doing. Right. Tones drop, house fire. There's a level of excitement that occurs. So there's a first trigger event that, that happens. Everything that comes subsequent to that for a lot of people gets stacked on top of that first action, right? That first kind of moment of excitement and understand fear and excitement are the exact same physiological response. Really? The body doesn't know the difference between bombs or roller coaster, exact same physiological response. And so, you know, you get that moment of excitement things start to trigger internally. You start to get your chemical dump. Things start to shift phys physiologically. Heart rate starts to go up. Respirations become a little bit more shallow, a little bit more frequent, you know, and that's going to vary in degrees, right? Over right. time, 
as we dose ourselves to experience that the impact of that is less and less. And then, so if we, each moment requires what I like to call a recovery point. So tones go off, get to the fire truck, get in, sit down, whew, breathe. You know, breath is such the key to balancing your central nervous system. When you start to get out of whack, when it when one side starts to take over, that breath is key to balance. And that's where that point of recovery comes. So for me, tones drop, hop in the, you know, get your gear on, hop in the fire truck, get situated, get the map book open. You're kind of in a little frantic pace and breathe. You know, I had a rule, two breaths before I talked on the radio, period, every single time. Nice. Right? That was just the rule. Two breaths before I spoke on the radio. Uh, Cause I didn't want to sound like an idiot. <laughs> you know? We'll get to that one in a minute. <laughs> oh dude. I've had, and there's plenty of recording. So yeah. we're in, you know, I've got sound like an idiot. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a recovery point. Then as I'm going, I'm going to get radio traffic. I'm going to get information coming in as, as the engine officer, or even the guy in the back, right. I always talk about who's the critical point of influence. Oh, Oh, Right. And it can be anybody. It can be a guy on the back step. It can be the driver. It can be the engine officer. It can be anybody in the mix. Who's the person that is actually taking the moment to kind of recover from things, settle down and balance the energy. Oh, Oh, that one sent chills. That yeah, dude, dude. I, I, dude. Th- as soon as you said that I, I go through my mind and think, Oh my gosh, the last time that happened, it was not the officer. It, yeah. it, it was the senior firefighter saying, Hey, look, LT, <laughs> let's pump the brakes here for a second because you are slideways. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, and asking simple questions, you know, hey, LT, what do you, I'm going to do this when we get there. What do you think? Right. You know, just causes that little bit of, wait a minute, reality check, come back in, uh, you know, talking to the driver, being in, being in that level of communication, uh, running through. I used to, right in front of the fire truck, I would always tell my, my guys were great. I right. Mean, they knew, they knew their jobs. But I would always going down the road, refresh, you know, okay, you've got the hook, you got the can, right? You know, you got the entry tools, boom, 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 everybody good. This is the plan of approach. When we get there, I'll call any adjustments if we need to, but you know, your job, everybody good. And I get that final check and yep, I'm good. Yep. I'm good. Just that moment of reassurance, right? It's that we're okay. We're good. Right. Uh, and being that critical point of influence allows for the, the whole team to begin to recover so if I don't, right, then we, then I'm stacking on top, then radio traffic comes in and, you know, whatever it comes in as, you know, units on scene reporting, you know, well-involved house or, you know, elevation rise, right? My physical, my physiological response goes up, uh, you know, whatever may come in, people trapped, whatever it is, right? Boom, 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 each time. And I'm not recovering from each of those. Then I arrive on scene. Now I've got to work in fire. Now I have to make some decisions and I'm a young Lieutenant, you know, I need to look good. I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. All these, all this narrative starts to kick in on what's going on. So now not only is my physiological response up, but my, my narrative now starts to accelerate the, the voice in the head starts to accelerate because none of us want to look like an asshole. And <laughs> you know Dude, that, that's always there you're so explaining wanted. my last six months of my life <laughs> <laughs> it's always there man. we can't shy away from it none of us want to look like a total freaking idiot well but i mean it, at the same time it's like i think that as i've I, I may be a young lieutenant but i'm still an old person my mm-hmm. give a darn is not there anymore i'm going to do what i think is right and then if I make a mistake, I'll, I'll, I'll take up for the actions. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was driving a lighter truck the other day. We roll up on apartment fire. My narrative showed something that I did not see. I'm telling you. I'm telling you right now. So when my captain and the jump seat guy went in to go for rescues, I was like, okay, we need to start getting this thing because my captain can't talk on the radio because he's actively doing three rescues. I mean, they, they end up walking themselves out. So I start barking on the radio. I mean, and when I start barking, and you and I talked about this in our last webcast, I, I can't tell you how my brain works, but my wife says I've got this ability that not very many people have. I can slow down in the moment and see 10 steps ahead, which you said is probably a bad thing, which I agree no, with you. No, 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 not actually. Ten, you know, that's I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's when I start barking up, I'm like, hey, hey, truck, we can't get our ladder up. I need you to the roof. Engine four, yeah. go to the side C. We got the door forced for you and the line charged for you. Yeah. And when you start rattling that stuff off, how do we get 
And man, I tell you what, you're giving some great nuggets for these young people, those these young jump seeds out there. To just take a second and breathe to stop the stacking effect. How does one start getting that? Um, I guess it's the op mindset again, right? Yeah, man. I mean, I think it's just the ability to see the actions that need to be taken, right? Uh, you know, and that comes when you balance the internal systems. Balance. And so again, we're going back to you know, that point of recovery, that willingness to pause in sheer chaos. Uh, and that's the separator, right? Between the guys who have been around for some time and the right. young guys, the young guys just want to get in there, do their job. They want to impress everybody. You know, they're excited. It's a fire. They don't get very many fires or they don't get, you know, very many traps or whatever's there. And they just dive in and go. And so the discipline really, and this goes across the board, man. I mean, this is from pro athletes to, I had a great conversation with the, uh, relief pitcher for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. We were standing, you know, back in the bullpen for an hour talking about the walk from the bullpen to the mound. Oh, wow. And yeah. Yeah. And like what that, what occurs in that moment, you know? And so, and the variations that occur in that moment, you know, is the, is the game on the line? What kind of performances do you have to have? What are the expectations and all that garbage that runs through your head? And so listen, it's no different. No. But, but really, you know, the willingness to pause in distinct moments, regardless of what's happening, just the two, three second breath, just the look around, see what's there. It opens up all of that, right? right? It, that, it opens up that experience. And that's what's occurring for you is then things become fluid. And that's that flow, you know, which everybody reads about, talks about, right? Flow is nothing more than your brain and body working cohesively. Nice. That's it. It is the narrative functioning with the internal systems. It's everything working together so you can see what actions need to be taken and be in action. You know, mindset is not about dwelling on shit. It's about being in action. It's about taking the, the next action based on the conditions as they're occurring. And so when you begin to see, you know, we had ran a fire years ago, my driver, garage fire, breezeway, burning into the house, burning the house next door. They made the choice to take the first line of the exposure. Hey, that's their choice, right? right. I'm dropping the engine, um, had the second engine on my ass. So I got good water supply right off the bat. I looked around like, we got to do something here, All right? So I've got my guys coming down. I'm like, deck gun, two and a half, pull it off, set the deck gun up. You know, and even the guy setting the deck gun up, like set it down at the end of the drive. I'm like, no, get <laughs> Run up, pick that thing up, got it as close to the as close to the garage as I possibly could. Go back, charge lines. Right, right, uh, right. You know, this was a. I, I think we had like eight lines running in the first three minutes, and then one of the one of the the uh, Fairfax County career guys who lives down the street had come by, and I'm running around like chicken with my head got off. He stopped me at one point. He's like, "Hey, man, I picked you. Like, <laughs> thanks, dog." <laughs> Fire trucks like bouncing off the ground. You know? I'm like, thanks, man, appreciate that. Right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, man. So you see the actions that you need to take, and that's what's occurring. And then you be able to communicate those effectively, dude. That's a, that's the win. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not that I don't think is that's not future casting. You're right, not right. off in that spot. Right, right, right. Right. You're in action and what needs to be what needs to be taking place. And that's the discipline the young guys, if they can develop is in their first five year span of really understanding options, what options are available, what needs to be done. Dude, they're, they'll be champions. Man, I tell you, you're hitting so many key points that I guess I didn't realize we were doing. And, and being involved in the active recruit process, and we do, we, we do a hell week with these kids. And, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like we progressively add stress to them. To the, the, the final burn of the week may or may not have a positive pressure fan on the intake side of the fire. Right? Right. It, yep. It's all hearsay. But watching them develop that mindset – and then fast forward to being on a structure fire with confirmed entrapment with one of those kids. And I mean, I'm telling you what, it's like, he, it was like six months later, he'd been on shift. And I'm telling you what, this kid performed like, oh my gosh, you could have wrote a script and this kid, and, and it was just like, we, we had to first force the, force the front door. So here's the old fat Lieutenant and the brand new snot nose probie that we put through hell week. And then the, throw in the mix another older, even older captain. And, I mean, it was like someone was playing an orchestra. 
Yeah. I think it's like you've got to build that stressful environment from day one. And unfortunately, there are some that cannot make it. And I can imagine so in, in your world, especially when you get to the high level stuff, there's a lot of people that don't make it. But I'd rather find them now on day two than day 600, right? Yeah, totally, man. Absolutely. And, you know, and you're building a set of, of skills within an individual. Not only are they capable of doing the job based on repetitive tasks, based on, you know, task memory, right? Right. I mean, I, I know what I need to do. I know I need to have to throw a ladder. And, right, right. And then I think, you know, part of this is also, I think you and I spoke about this, like giving the guys the freedom to act and oh. shoot. You know, it's like I used to tell people I, when I taught the tower stuff, the truck driver, truck operator stuff, you know, like, listen, I don't, I don't give a shit what it looks like. I just want it done. 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 I need a ladder to the second floor. That's all I need. However that occurs, I don't care. <laughs> as long as I have a ladder to the second floor, that's what I actually care about. And, you know, they understand proper deployment of a ladder. They understand all that stuff. Then based on the conditions, are they capable of getting it done? Right. And if that means based on whatever's going on, you know, it's it's like I like people to experience stuff before they have to experience. Right. Stuff. Right. Right. So drag, drag that, you know, pull that 35 foot off, drag it across the freaking yard, make it look ugly, get that thing thrown, have done it. Right. Have done. It's like I used to, you know, when I would do, teach shooting programs, right. Shooting from a close in position. If you've never shot a weapon, you know, from the ready position or from a, from a close in position, that's a, you know, you get the, you get the blast in the face. You, it, it's a, it's a little shock to the system. And if you've never done that, I don't want, I don't want the first time that you do that right. to be a requirement that you do that. <laughs> right. It, it's, it's all right. You, you, you're blowing my mind again. I mean, it's just like, I am so obsessed with what you teach because I see it on the streets. I see it on the, the, the day five guy or girl, and I see it in the 30 year chief, but it's like building the stacking effect is something that, that just blows my mind because when I teach, especially in my hoarding class, it's like, listen, when you arrive on scene, I don't want a 20 minute dissertation. What the dang house looks like on scene, work and fire, going to work, need water, shut up, go work. Because I don't want to build that stack in you. It's, let's just say you're my second arriving officer. I oh, want your canvas to be clean. Yeah. Because if you roll up and I've said we've gone completely defensive, we're, we're mining the B exposure and D exposure, and all of a sudden you see me and my jump seat firefighter going through the front door, you're like, whoa, oh. Right. So, I mean, how do, you, how do we get – I, I don't know if I, the word I'm looking for is buy-in, but it's like we've got to get, get the mindset right from day one to day to your last day. How do we start building that repetitive decision making? And, and I think that's where our friends at Brute Force come into it. I think you and I were talking about go do 80 burpees and do like a simple math equation or something like that. Was that what we were talking about? Yeah, you know, I've ran a, you know, I'd make guys run, do stuff, all kinds of things, and then come up and I'd have a board, I'd have a progressively more difficult math problems, and I'd give them like, you know, three minutes to complete all the math problems. And of course, you're under time constraints, and right. you want to do well. Um, and then you'd have to run over through a couple other obstacles and then shoot, right, and then engage targets at various distances, and uh, I'll be scored, I'll be pointed, you know, whole nine yards. And so, you know, those little things start to cause disconnect, right? Because they're two totally unrelated right. points in time. <laughs> and, you know, you begin to understand what impacts your job and what doesn't. And I think that's where, that's where when you begin to train effectively, it is understanding what, what impacts my outcome, the result I want to produce, and what doesn't. Right. And making that decision. Do I go to the exposure? Or do I go in? All right. If I go in and hit the attack line, do I have the capability to actually stop that fire in, you know, a given period in time before it continues to move on? If I don't, then I need to go to the exposure. Like what's the decision making cycle that's occurring there? But all of that is based on what result do I want to produce? And do I have the ability to produce that result? Oh, in, in a time compressed matter. That's yeah, the part. Like yeah, yeah. That's the part in our business that I don't think that a lot of officers, especially young officers get that. Listen, you don't have 30 minutes. You've got about 30 seconds 
yeah. make a call. And I don't want my people to be scared to make a call. And I think that's no. where your three foot rule and your 10 degree rule is make the dang call. Totally. Uh, if you're screwing it up and the chief gets there, he's going to fix it or she's going to fix it. Or if you're my second arriving officer, hey, 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 Ryan, this is not, I mean, we need to be able, but you also have to throw that ego aside and say, hey, listen, I need to listen to you because you see something that I don't. Dude, totally. I mean, I, you know, there's a couple of guys that drove for me, uh, you know, growing up, my best friend, you know, when we would be, uh, when he would drive for me for a while and then he became my lieutenant, right? He would run the engine, I'd run the truck. Um, but us together, man, it was beautiful. I mean, it was like, it was just in flow all the time. Um, and I, I loved when, when people would say stuff and just super open to the contribution of everybody around me. Right. Everybody sees things. And I think as a young guy, you don't want to say anything. You don't want to step on anybody's toes. Um, you know, but really speaking up and speaking up in a way that's like, Hey, what about, you know, could we do this? And there's a big difference between being the know-it-all in the back of the engine, right. Or back of the truck and contributing to the action, right. <laughs> Keeping the action moving forward. And so, you know, finding that balance and then the willingness to say that stuff. Yeah, man. I mean, it's all, it's that three foot time and space rule. Can I accomplish what I need to accomplish in this time and space? Right. You know, and as an experience, as any level of experience, you should be able to look and say, you know, rate of fire, you know, flow, push the smoke, all these things going on gives me an indicator that the fire is burning at this speed. You know, I will need X amount of water to put that, like all that calculation has to happen right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, then do I have that ability? And I think, you know, and I, we'll talk about this on another time, but, you know, we talk about the five fractures of performance, like the five top things that consistently come back. And number one at the top is perception of your abilities. Bro. It is a skewed perception oh. of your abilities, dude. And that every single time doing debriefs, doing interviews, looking at live operations, looking at things around the world, looking at everything else, it boils down to this deeper sense of, I wasn't comfortable in my ability to make that call, to make that decision, to take that action, to do those things. And like you just said, it's really about the willingness to act and adjust. Man, I, that's going to be have to be another podcast because we're definitely got to dig on that one. Because I think that's what paralyzes a lot of older fire officers. Yeah. Let's just face it. Ryan's 44 years old. I'm about 50 pounds heavier than I should be. And it's like, even if I do make the right call, do I have that ability to go carry out that task function or or skill. And I can mm -hmm. see that in our older fire officers, they know what they need. They know what the right thing to do is, but sometimes they don't do it because they physically cannot do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes, you know, that we'll talk about, it. you know, that's dude. Yeah. And that's where I go from being an actor to an architect, right? That's where you right. step back and then, you know, start tasking people and, and understand where that is and understand what your ability is and then under, and then let that sit for a few minutes to see what you need to do to have the abilities. And I think that's where, you know, we're talking with brute force so much about this stuff is how do you, how are you retain the, the ability and the capability to perform at the level you want to perform? Right. Um, you know, and so, yeah, man, that's a, that's a, such a huge piece of it. Well, and it, it's, it's, and I see it as I get older. So like yesterday I was assigned to the, I, I did a shift trade on the number two engine, the number two engine goes to fires at least about every other day. I mean, and it's just like, I had that op mindset going, it's like different and it shouldn't be going yeah. to my ladder truck that I'm assigned to. We don't run fires that often, but yet we yeah. had two the other day, but going into that engine two shift yesterday, it's like, Hey, I'm going to be a little bit more aware. I'm going to be a little bit more, uh, knowing what's going on. Cause I know this thing's going to go do it. It's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when it's just like how do we get that and, and, and as we as we age and we perform and it, it, it i don't know I, my mind's just spinning even more because i watched the document the documentary on the las vegas shooting and right. watching those police officers react within their 10 degrees i mean yeah. lives were saved but then yet they have to process so many more of these variables and maybe we can dig into that on the next podcast but oh yeah dude there's there's so much there's so much to talk about here uh and I think that's it. Like it's becomes the, the curiosity. Yeah. The, the, of why. And I think that's probably Ooh. why I'm going to make everybody crazy <laughs> over my life. Cause you know, I'm just all sitting around going, well, why, why do we need to, you know, and not in a judgmental way, but no. like how 
the curiosity of like, I really want to understand that. Right. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you this one. This is my, I'm working on my TED talk for it. So, uh, cause I think this is probably the most relevant thing ever said to me. Uh, so Al Dutton, who was one of my mentors in the fire service, uh, retired, uh, battalion chief from DC, went to work for DC fire department in 74, passed away several years ago. Um, you know, Al was the quintessential fireman, right? Like the, the salty dog fireman, um, great story behind him just, and such a, such a rad human being. And at 17, we were sitting on the front bumper of the fire truck and I'll just never forget this. Right. And this really created kind of the context for how I learned and operated and functioned all of my life across everything that I've gotten to do. Uh, you know, and he, he looked at me and he said, all right, Jeff, I'm going to give you the three rules. I said, all right, what do you got? And he said, rule one, if it's not on fire, it's not a big deal. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. Absolutely. And you know, how much do we make a big deal out of that bullshit? Right. 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 Uh, so rule one, not on fire, not a big deal. All right. I said rule two, R- rule two, if it is on fire and you do your job, it'll go out. And I was like, yeah. You know, that's really true. And I used to, I took that and I would teach that to my guys, even from the time we pulled up, okay, where was the fire when we pulled up and we go inside and we look at smoke marks, we look at char marks, we look at burn marks, we look at where the fire stopped, you know, and they'd always go, well, you know, if we did our job effectively, if we did our job, the fire went out when we pulled up. Right. Right. And then the third rule is if it didn't go out, if you did your job and it didn't go out, it wasn't going to go out anyway. You know, so three rules of life, man, dude, I've applied this to every aspect of my life. One, if it's not on fire, it's not a big deal. Two, if it is on fire and you do your job, it'll go out. And three, if you did your job and it doesn't go, it didn't go out, it wasn't going to go out anyway. You know, and that to me is really the summation of what an operational mindset looks like, because that takes both a narrative, it takes everything, takes a narrative, takes a physiological response, takes a curiosity, takes a behavior pattern to really like embody that in everything that you do dude that is such i mean that's powerful I, and, and and if you guys watch it on youtube right now as long as jeff says it's okay we'll post this up on youtube i haven't been sure. texting or, or facebook and i've been taking notes and dude i have absolutely worn my new phone out with this that is some fantastic stuff jeff it, if it's not a big deal if it's not on fire if it is on fire and you do your job it's going to go out and if you do your job and it didn't go out it wasn't going to go out anyway that is, yeah, that's three rules to live by. Jeff, thank you for coming on Jump Seat Radio. Thank you for your, what's your content that you're putting out there. And where can uh, all the Jump Seat, I, I know that you got some online classes going out. I've, I've got my credit card ready to swipe because I'm going <laughs> to yeah. be your first student on there because this op mindset just is, is so intriguing to me. Where they, can they find your information at? Yeah, man. So they can just hit opmindset.com. That's opmindset.com. Uh, you know, and what I'm hoping to create there, bring it, brought it back alive, uh, really pushing for the launch here in 2019. Um, there'll be some masterclass series coming up uh, and available uh, at, uh, you know, try to keep it at a really reasonable uh, price point there. But uh, but really the site in of itself, the articles, the video, the five minute mindset, the things that are going on there, uh, you know, my, my objective there is just to bring a conversation forward, bring this conversation forward. Right. Because I think it applies to everybody. And so, you know, my hope is that over time it kind of becomes a, you know, user driven site. Uh, so if you got a topic you want us to hit, you got us uh, an incident you want us to look at, just shoot us a note, right? And we'll get on it uh, and, and uh, really have, have the conversation. And your YouTube channel and your website and all that stuff is, this is my favorite word, it's free. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this conversation really, the courses are designed that if you, and if you want to take the course, which is highly valuable in the context of the course, right. you take it. Um, you know, everything else, you know, um, we'll be launching the five minute mindset coming up, right? So five minute chalk talk, we'll pick a topic, we'll go to town five minutes, you're done. Um, and all that stuff is there and available. Uh, just because I think it's so critically important. You know, I look at this, I've been doing, I always say I've been talking about mindset and biofeedback before mindset and biofeedback were cool. <laughs> And I don't feel like the conversation has gotten to where it needs to be yet. So uh, we're bringing it back forward, uh, full steam ahead. 
and they can find you on the on the book of the face at op mindset work what about your twitter and your the, the uh, instagram uh, facebook is yeah facebook is just facebook slash op mindset uh twitter's op mindset and then my instagram is just mine jeff bandman uh so they can find me by my name or by op by uh, the op mindset stuff well, Jeff, I can't thank you enough for your series that you're doing for Brute Force. Uh, you've given me, a, <laughs> you've made my mind spin in a matter of 44 <laughs> minutes again. I mean, if you, you guys are watching on YouTube right now, here's my notes from the first session that he had. And it's so funny that you, we hit the stack effect. I really think that I'm going to take, I took a lot of good notes to this one. And I'm going to put this out there. Uh, the human behavior, the, the, the causes of the behavior, the body, brain, your aperture. Oh my gosh, that is another 40 minute podcast right there. Uh, you're 30 degrees, you're three feet, and you're big three, man. Thank you so much for sharing that with the Jump Seat Nation. And I'm sure we're going to absolutely blow up your social media feed as soon as we hit the publish button on this podcast. Hey, dude, absolutely. Hey, I really enjoyed it. I love having this conversation. Thanks for having me on. Uh, and, you know, I just like being available and having that, having that talk. You've been listening to Jump Seat Radio Podcast, the podcast that brings you the operation mindset. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Jump Seat Views. Follow us on Twitter at Jump Seat Views. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash views from the jump seat. And make sure to head on over to iTunes and give us that five star, five star rating. We'll see you next week, everyone, and have a happy new year.